Welcome to Module 4. In this video, we're going to be talking about the Sun as our example star and getting to know it in a little bit more detail. It's at the center of our solar system, but it is just one star out of many in the larger structure that we're part of called the galaxy. We're going to be investigating throughout Module 4 and beyond the different topics that astronomers study using the tools that we learned about in Module 3. So let's get started. So first, for us to really process the scale shift when we go from talking about planets in the solar system to talking about stars in our solar system and beyond, we really need to understand that we are talking about this vastly different size scale, and then we're going to move on to the distances uh, and that vast uh, scale difference for distances. So the sun is huge. It is over a hundred times bigger across than the earth. And that tells us that because volume cares about um, radius cubed, instead of just a hundred times more volume, it's a hundred times a hundred times a hundred, we could fit a million earths inside the sun if it were like a big hollow basket. Another uh, comparison that we could make that we saw briefly in Module 3 is that when we take the four big um, outer planets of our solar system, we could set that whole set of giant planets side by side four times and we would still not get as big across as the sun. In terms of distances, if the sun were the size of a quarter and I held it up here in Grand Rapids, let's say that we're standing on the um, GRCC campus, the farthest human-made object would be Voyager 1. It was launched in the 1970s, and it would be just a couple of city blocks away from campus. Then if we were to imagine me still holding up a quarter, the solar system that we think of, all of the stuff that we learned about in Module um, 3, in Module 2, <laughs> Uh, extends about 150 miles in all directions from our uh, scale model. So we're thinking about the Oort cloud maybe all the way out to Chicago. And then the single closest star to us, if I'm holding up a quarter in Grand Rapids, would be somebody holding up a nickel in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, which would be the uh, example Proxima Centauri, a slightly smaller star that is 400 miles away in our scale model. And when we think about the travel time light takes uh, going at the speed of light, uh, Proxima Centauri is four light years away from us. So even if we were to send a little flashlight signal, it would take four years to get over to that nearest neighbor that we have. Everything else would be empty space in all directions until we got to the next closest star, which would actually still be in the same system as Proxima Centauri. So... We have these vast size and scale differences. How do we know what the sun is made out of if we can't travel there? Now, we already have part of the answer to this question, hopefully, for Module 3, thinking about Chapter 5 in our textbook and the nature of light and absorption lines. We've seen a picture like this in our slides where each of those dark absorption lines corresponds to a particular element in the periodic table. And so we know that there's all of these different elements present, uh, and the same elements are also found on Earth, which is how we knew to find the patterns to begin with. But it actually took until the 1920s with the work from Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin for anyone to realize that the actual makeup, how much of each thing, was vastly different than the Earth. So what Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin identified in her PhD work was that the sun is roughly three quarters hydrogen and one quarter helium. At most, like 2% of the sun is other stuff in the periodic table, but it's mostly hydrogen and helium um, at very high temperatures. And for a while, very few people believed her. She um, was even told by her thesis advisor to kind of walk back some of the conclusions and say, well, maybe it's right, maybe it's not. Um, and it took a while for confirming evidence to better support that hypothesis. But we now know that to be the case. And that three quarters hydrogen number is one we're gonna continue to see over and over because we really have a universe full of mostly 
three quarters hydrogen and one quarter helium. And when we eventually get to the end of the semester, when we talk about the beginning moments of the universe, we'll learn that that's roughly what it started with and not too much has changed. Now, when we look at how all of that material is distributed, the different temperatures, the different pressures, what we learn is that the sun has specific regions, both what we would consider interior uh, zones and exterior layers. We're going to be talking more about how the heat and light in the inside moves around in a later video. For now, we're going to name these layers, um, but really focus on the outside of the sun. So the core of this star, the core of our sun, is about 20% of its volume. It's the source of all of the sun's energy, a process that we will talk about in more detail later on. And we can't really treat the sun as being made out of a gas because it is far too hot. All of the electrons have been stripped free of the atomic nuclei, and so the material in the sun acts as a plasma, a fourth state of matter, instead of a gas. Now, if we were to take a photograph of the sun on a clear day, um, not with our eyeballs, never look directly at the sun, but if we took a photograph, uh, we'd be taking a photograph in visible light, the kind of light our eyes can see, and that photograph would be of the photosphere. Photo, photosphere, that's going to help us remember that that's what we see if we use visible light. We don't see any other layer if we're looking at regular visible light. From space, the sun looks a little bit more yellow. Um, on the ground, we actually really kind of view it as a yellowish white. Um, nothing, uh, all the uh, plant life around us doesn't have like this yellowish hue like we're wearing sunglasses. It seems like it's white light coming down to us. And that photosphere is the surface where we would determine the temperature that we use to compare stars with each other. And that specific surface temperature is 5800 Kelvin. And we can think back to um, Module 3 when we were talking about Wien's Law and how the temperature determines the color. That specific temperature is going to correspond to a yellowish-white color. All right, so that's the photosphere, visible light. Now, if we zoomed in really close on the photosphere, still using visible light, we would see this kind of cool pattern show up. This pattern is called granulation, and it comes from the fact that hotter material is coming up from lower down, rising to the surface while being a hot temperature, releasing some of that heat, and then colder material is sinking back down again. This process is called convection, and it's the same thing that happens when you boil water. It's the same thing that happens in Earth's mantle. It is a um, kind of physics process that can happen in a lot of different circumstances when you have a heat source and material that is moving in order to distribute that heat. Uh, there's a cool time-lapse video that you can check out uh, in the link for the posted slides. And if you have ever made any kind of broth, um, so not a clear liquid, but some kind of broth, maybe like a miso soup, you can actually see this pattern on the surface of the um, liquid in the pot if you are heating it from below on a, on a stovetop. And if we zoom in uh, a little bit less on the photosphere, the other really key structure that we see for this layer is sunspots. So sunspots are darker because they are colder. There's still plenty of material there, but they are darker because they are colder. When we zoom in, we can see that there's still lots of material there. These are pretty impressive um, structures. And they tend to form in groups. They tend to have an extra dark center and this less dark uh, outer region. Uh, in picture A here, we have a whole sunspot group, two of which would be sunspots that are roughly the size of the Earth. Uh, in B, we have an even further zoomed in view from a relatively recent telescope, DKIST, on Earth. Uh, and we're seeing a sunspot that is very high resolution. Rather than being the whole size of the planet, it's just the size of the United States. And scientists are able to explore this pattern in a lot more detail. And in that part B, you can see that same granulation pattern that we were talking about because we have zoomed in more uh, like we did before.
So there's a lot of cutting edge learning that we can get from the relatively new telescopes that we continue to build to study our own star, the sun. Now, uh, we talked about eclipses briefly in Module 2, and during a solar eclipse, the new moon fully covers up the really bright photosphere. So we've been talking about the photosphere, and during an eclipse, it's gone. It's missing. And for hundreds of years, astronomers could only study the layers above the photosphere by going to a site where they could get totality, by traveling around the globe and planning ahead for years in order to be at the right place at the right time to see anything else besides that super bright photosphere. And so it is from these centuries old uh, eclipse expeditions that we get the term chromosphere, which comes from chromos, the Greek for color, because during an eclipse, the bright pinkish red that we see is a layer above the photosphere, and it has this, this really impressive color, so they called it the chromosphere. And there's little spikes of material we'll see the name for on another slide um, that were little spikes, so they were called spicules, and that's a key part of the chromosphere. But before we move on from this slide, I also want to note that there's this kind of diffuse white glow all around the um, chromosphere as well. That's a different layer called the corona. We are seeing visible light, but it does not produce a lot of visible light. Most of the corona light is in extreme ultraviolet or x-rays, and it's only when we completely block the bright photosphere that that faint diffuse glow is actually visible to us. And even this image is um, really enhancing through Photoshop what that glow would really look like to our eyes. It wouldn't look as intense, although it would still be visible during totality. So as I mentioned verbally uh, on the previous slide, the main feature that is relevant for our understanding of the chromosphere are spicules, so little tiny spikes that can be seen sometimes in um, during totality for a solar eclipse, but more often we are studying them with spacecraft that we have designed to look at this layer. And you can kind of see this like grassy looking region. Um, if you were to draw with a crayon what grass looks like, um, it would be all these little tiny spikes. And those are spicules. It is thought that they are an important part of the process for a very, um, a very intense jump in temperature from the photosphere and chromosphere to the corona. So I want us to pause briefly and to look at the um, plot on the right side of the screen. A lot of my own uh, PhD work, my dissertation work, was on studying these outer layers of the sun and trying to understand more the science behind this temperature jump. So the core of the sun is at millions of degrees. We will come back to the processes that happen to it uh, in a later video. But as we leave that energy source, the temperature drops the same way that if you walked away from a campfire, it would get, get less hot. But right after the chromosphere, we can see on the plot that the temperature is uh, below 10,000 degrees around the chromosphere. Right after the chromosphere, we get from about 10,000 Kelvin up to over a million Kelvin in the corona. And we have to pause for a second and realize that we've already learned the fact that temperature is supposed to be telling us about the speed that atoms and molecules are moving around. We use it in everyday lives to, to talk about whether we feel hot or whether we feel cold, but temperature is really telling us how fast atoms and molecules are moving. So this temperature jump, rather than thinking that we would be kind of standing in an inferno of a million degrees, it is telling us that the very few particles that are in the corona are moving at extremely fast speeds. That is a more useful way to think about what's happening in the corona because the density is so low that these atoms and molecules are not hitting each other. So they're not able to um, kind of slow each other down because there's so few of them. 
So the corona itself is incredibly hot in terms of temperature, that over 1 million degrees, which is, which is telling us that the atoms and molecules, the ions that are part of it, are moving at very high temperatures. And so when we study it, we're using the extreme ultraviolet or x-rays, which is what's shown here in the bottom um, picture. Now, there are several things labeled in this picture for the corona. We have coronal holes, which are dark regions because they are missing material. That is different than sunspots, which are dark because they are colder. And we have active regions, which are extra bright, and coronal loops where we can visibly see loops of uh, material that are extending beyond the general sphere of the sun. These are all important features of, of space weather, and so that's something that we'll be talking about more in an upcoming video. But I do want to make sure to note these terms while we're introducing these different uh, terms and vocabulary. The corona is the layer of the sun where the two most important features we want to understand are active regions, which look very bright and have loops of material because of magnetic field, and coronal holes which look very dark because there is less material trapped there. So coronal holes look dark because there's less plasma. When we look at them, and I can kind of go back and forth between these two, we can see that they look extra dark in these areas, in these regions. And then active regions, uh, you could have maybe guessed where they might have been uh, on the first image, and they're labeled here. Active regions are extra bright, and one of the really important things for, un for us to understand is active regions, the extra bright parts of the corona, are directly lined up with sunspots, the dark regions in the photosphere. So if we were to connect any two things in our head, it would be active regions and sunspots, not the two things that are dark for vastly different reasons. So this is an image from 2013 of the same patch of the sun, on the left, we're using visible light to look at the photosphere. We see the sunspot groups. And on the right, we're looking at extreme ultraviolet. Uh, we're looking at the corona, and we're seeing uh, some, suns, uh, some active regions directly above where those sunspot groups would have been. Helioviewer.org is a website where you can uh, look at all of these layers and kind of transition between them. And there's a lab that um, we sometimes do that, that uses it. So I encourage you to check out that resource. It's linked at the bottom of the slide. So as we wrap up this kind of introduction video, giving us all of these different terms and how they relate to each other, if you've been struggling to think about what the most important parts to record for your understanding, it might be this slide specifically. And all of these terms don't mean much if we don't have the, the images to go along with them. So all of those previous slides help support what this kind of summary slide is meant to help us with. But if you have any questions or concerns uh, on any of these facts, make sure to follow up with me so we can feel confident in understanding each of these statements, what these features are, how we're observing them, what they look like, uh, because that will be relevant to our further discussion of how the sun affects the earth and then thinking about the sun as an example star. So I look forward to continuing module four with you in the next video. Thanks for watching.